Good afternoon again, and welcome to the 12th annual Founders Day Lecture presented by the University of Georgia Alumni Association and the Emeritus Scholars. I'm Deborah Dietzler, Executive Director of Alumni Relations, and I thank you for joining us to celebrate 229 years since the establishment of UGA as the nation's first state chartered institution. Obviously, the weather is not cooperating as we had hoped it would, so we are going to truncate some pieces of this to get you on the roads and home as safely as possible and as soon as possible. So please understand that whilst I had prepared a very uh, lengthy introduction of our president here on campus, he truly needs no introduction. So please join me in welcoming our 22nd president, Jerry W. Moorhead. Thank you, Debbie, and welcome to today's Founders Day lecture. We recognize this occasion not only to commemorate the founding of this great institution, but also to celebrate the birthplace of public higher education in America, which, as you know, began with the signing of the charter by Abraham Baldwin and others 229 years ago yesterday in Savannah. Those founders established a firm foundation which has now grown, I'm proud to say, into one of the top 20 public research universities in America. We now have 17 schools and colleges here, a new health sciences campus, which also houses, I should note, our medical partnership as well as our College of Public Health, we have extended campuses in Tifton, Griffin, Gwinnett, Washington, D.C., Oxford, England, Cortona, Italy, and in Costa Rica. And we have extension and service operations literally going on in every county in this state. So after more than 200 years, our reach clearly is virtually every place in the world. What I think is important, though, is that our impact on this great state and beyond is not just about teaching. It's not just about research. It's not just about public service. It's about all of those things that a great flagship university does. One of the things that I have always appreciated about Founders Day at UGA is it is centered on a lecture. And today you will have the opportunity to hear from one of the finest faculty members in this country, Dr. Locke Johnson, who is fulfilling that responsibility for us today. But today we also had the chance to honor two individuals for meritorious service to our university. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to present the first President's Medals, a special recognition program recommended by our Emeriti Scholars to two distinguished individuals who gave great service to this institution. The first recipient, was Dr. Louise McBay, McBee, who, as you know, served this institution in so many, many ways for such a long period of time, literally 25 years of service to the University of Georgia, ranging from Vice President for Academic Affairs to Dean of Women. And then when Dr. McBee retired from the University of Georgia, she went on to have a long and distinguished career in the General Assembly, serving not only this institution's interests, but the interests of our state as one of the most able and distinguished representatives the General Assembly has ever had. So we appreciated the chance to have Dr. McBee with us earlier today and to uh, provide that honor and make it to her. The second recipient of the President's Medal was the late Dr. Tom Dyer, who, as you know, we lost far too early in his extraordinary life. 
Dr. Dyer served this institution as a distinguished faculty member, as a senior administrator serving in a variety of positions, including vice president for instruction. And he also became literally the historian of the University of Georgia, as well as a major authority on higher education, culminating in his leadership of the Institute of Higher Education. He was a personal mentor and friend, not only to me, but to many of you in this audience today. And in my view, will be remembered as one of the greatest public servants this institution has ever known. Both of these iconic figures, Dr. Louise McBee and Dr. Tom Dyer, were very, very deserving of this particular honor. I was, as I said, honored to present the medal earlier to Dr. McBee. I presented Dr. Dyer's medal uh, to his widow who is with us today, and I'd like to ask Anna uh, if she would stand, also a double dog at the University of Georgia, and please join me in welcoming Anna Dyer here today. Anna. Before I conclude my remarks, I want to express my special appreciation again to the Emeriti Scholars for creating the President's Medal, uh, as well as to Ms. Barbara Mann, who is with us today. She designed uh, the medal that was presented to uh, these worthy recipients. Thank you all for your presence here at Founders Day, even on a cold, snowy, chilly day, and for your continued service and support of the University of Georgia. Thanks so much. Thank you, President Moorhead. And again, in the spirit of keeping this brief, uh, Dr. Locke Johnson merits a very lengthy introduction but we are going to cut that very short. I believe that there is a bio available on the program you received on the way in. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Locke Johnson. I decided if I was going to fall on my face, I'd rather do it back there than over here. <laughs> Welcome fellow members of the UGA Polar Bear Club. <laughs> it's a little chilly out there. You are an intrepid group and made of hardy stock to come out on a day like this. And those of us on the program, thank you very much for coming. All of you need to receive the Order of Abraham Baldwin for your bravery. Despite the cold, it's wonderful to be with you, particularly in this lovely old chapel we have. Deborah, thank you for your introduction. And President Moorhead, I do love the sound of that. President Moorhead. <laughs> Dr. Morris, I want to thank you for your fantastic service as interim Provost, you've, you've uh, done so much for us, and Godspeed on your next journey. Emeriti Scholars, members of the Alumni Association, members of the Teaching Academy, members of the Mr. Chips Society, other faculty colleagues, students and staff, fellow Athenians. Let me begin by saying happy, happy anniversary to the University of Georgia, and may I join in the praise for Dr. McBee and for the Dyer family. And I feel Tom's presence here today, and I feel his presence every day I walk across the campus. In the crucible of fear, the Constitution takes on malleable properties, or at least so some in Washington would seem to believe. In response to dangers real and imagined, power in the United States has from time to time become too concentrated into the hands of a few individuals. This is precisely 
what our founders cautioned against. James Madison, Abraham Baldwin, and their colleagues at the Constitutional Convention of 1787 were above all anti-power in their political philosophy. They sought to disperse government power among what they referred to as the three departments of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. Madison further advocated in Federalist Paper Number 51 auxiliary precautions, what today we would refer to as checks and balances, such as the right of Congress to hold hearings on executive branch activities. Yet all too often, our contemporary leaders have abandoned these bedrock principles of American government. During the Cold War, for example, fear of communism led our intelligence agencies to engage in widespread spying on American citizens who were simply anti-war, peaceful protesters or civil rights activists. More recently, in 2001, the Bush administration turned to a variety of questionable espionage programs. This time, in the name of counterterrorism. For example, the government engaged in warrantless wiretaps, a clear violation of the 1978 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, known as FISA for short. Moreover, the administration authorized extraordinary renditions and torture, held suspects in secret CIA prisons in Europe or in Guantanamo without due process or legal counsel, and as we have recently learned, assembled a vast data set consisting of US telephone records, as well as social media contacts of American citizens, their instant messaging accounts, and other so-called metadata. Although disclosed in a controversial manner by Edward Snowden in 2013, it has been important for the American people to find out about these excesses engaged in by the National Security Agency, the largest and the most heavily veiled of these secret agencies. President Bush also advanced ambiguous legislative proposals to strengthen executive control over security policy, including the Patriot Act. In the climate of fear generated by 9-11, lawmakers quickly approved these measures without hearings, without serious study, without debate. The Obama administration dropped some of the more extreme counterterrorism practices, renditions, secret prisons, torture, but gave a green light to the NSA ongoing data fishing expedition inside the United States. Critics of the NSA's metadata programs point to the ineffectiveness of unwieldy mass surveillance. Further, they remind us that previous episodes of spying against American citizens during the Cold War led to the political targeting of individuals and groups. The FBI's COINTELPRO operations, for example, even attempted to ruin the lives of citizens whose only crime was to engage in peaceful protests. One of the most well-known targets was, as you know, Dr. King. In rebuttal, the head of the NSA, General Keith Alexander, insists that the metadata programs have been vital anti-terrorist tools, and that furthermore, safeguards have been put in place to prevent government overreach. The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Patrick Leahy, punctured 
this effectiveness argument in public hearings last fall where General Alexander conceded under oath that the NSA's list of some 50 successes were more like three in number with some doubt about even that figure. Similarly, the president's own special review panel reported in December of 2013 that the metadata programs have no discernible impact on preventing acts of terrorism. The same conclusion reached last week by the Independent Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Even GOP Representative Sensenbrenner, a chief architect of the Patriot Act, has urged an end to the metadata program. As for safeguards, President Obama admitted in the New Yorker magazine this week that the NSA had, and I'm quoting, too much leeway to do whatever it wanted or could, unquote. And Dianne Feinstein, the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, acknowledged recently that her panel has had, had only limited access to information about the NSA's operations, some safeguards. The public has heard reassurances like General Alexander's before. Intelligence leaders, I can so vividly recall, offered reassurances throughout the 1960s that all was well. Only for lawmakers to discover in 1974 a horror chamber of domestic spy operations, including COINTELPRO, a CIA domestic spy program known as Operation Chaos, and yes, even back then, NSA snooping on the communications of Americans by way of Operation Shamrock. In 1975, Senator Walter Mondale questioned the NSA leadership about Shamrock in public hearings. Mondale. Were you concerned about its legality? NSA. Legality? Mondale. Whether it was legal? NSA. In what sense? <laughs> Whether that would have been a legal thing to do? Mondale. Yes. NSA. That particular aspect didn't enter into the discussion. Mondale, I was asking you if you were concerned about whether that would be legal and proper, NSA. We didn't consider it at the time, no. One can recall as well the false denials from the second Bush administration about the then secret use of torture and rendition by the CIA. Every democracy must wrestle with the dilemma of ensuring security for its citizens while at the same time safeguarding their liberty and privacy. In 1975, I served as assistant to Senator Frank Church, chair of a special committee assigned to investigate allegations about CIA spying here in the United States. Our 16-month inquiry confirmed that much of the work done by the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and the other secret agencies was laudable. Indeed, absolutely indispensable then and now to the security of this country. Yet, the committee uncovered an alarming number of abuses. Since then, the United States, more than any other country in history, has been attempting to achieve a workable balance between the legitimate protective activities of these secret agencies on the one hand and on the other hand, 
adequate measures of accountability. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, this equilibrium was lost, and it has yet to be restored. And Jeopardy is the system of intelligence checks and balances put in place by the Church Committee, including the credibility of the two intelligence oversight committees on Capitol Hill. The behemoth intelligence apparatus, 16 agencies strong, threatens to slide back into an earlier era when this nation's clandestine activities lay outside the safeguards established by the Constitution. Heightened concerned for security in the United States at the time of the 9-11 attacks was, of course, imperative. Our homeland had been brutally attacked. We had to bolster our defenses and defeat the terrorists. Unfortunately, though, the 350-page Patriot Act was more than lawmakers could carefully evaluate in the rush toward enactment. And while this bill sailed through the Congress, George Bush, our president, quietly authorized a rash of supporting executive orders, secret presidential directives that further expanded the authority of NSA and other agencies. Since then, nothing has been done to restrict the grab bag methods that continue to suck metadata into the NSA's sprawling computers. All absent reasonable suspicion that a targeted individual is involved in terrorism. This vacuum cleaner approach runs counter to a more acceptable strategy in a democracy, namely gathering intelligence against specifically targeted individuals who might be terrorists. The NSA's metadata program evokes Orwell's dystopian vision of society. Now we face the question of how to reset the proper balance between security and liberty. Two steps are essential. First, the executive branch must provide better information to Congress about its spy activities. And second, lawmakers must more effectively evaluate these intelligence initiatives. Throughout American history, members of Congress were kept in the dark about this nation's intelligence activities. Until 1974, when the Times revealed Operation Chaos. Lawmakers then ushered in an era of serious intelligence accountability. They created the House and the Senate Oversight Committees, designed to continuously review the operations of these secret agencies, their budgets, what they were doing at home and abroad, their fidelity to US law. In addition, lawmakers established reporting requirements <coughs> that mandated a steady flow of information from the executive branch to Congress about intelligence activities. The Intelligence Oversight Act of 1980 went so far even as to require anti-facto, that is prior, reporting on all significant intelligence operations, including, of course, the NSA's program. This far-reaching, unprecedented statute gave lawmakers a chance to take a look at these programs before they were implemented in the field. In times of emergency, the law allowed the executive branch to report only to eight members of Congress in advance, the so-called Gang of Eight, as they became known, four GOP members, uh, and for Democrats in both chambers. The expectation was, though, that within a timely manner, defined as two days, 
the full memberships of both the House and Senate committees would be informed about the operation in question. Yet, instead, the executive branch has frequently chosen to ignore the notion of power sharing. The second Bush administration bypassed the 1978 FISA law simply by ordering the director of the NSA to proceed with warrantless wiretaps based solely on executive authority. The general obeyed without a murmur of reservation. I'm talking about Michael Hayden. The proper approach would have been to propose amendments to the FISA statute rather than to simply pretend it didn't exist. Now the administration did deem to whisper into the ears of a few members of Congress and anointed few about the extra-legal NSA wiretaps. But when these operations finally surfaced in the New York Times in 2005, these chosen few remonstrated that they had been denied details and prohibited from discussing the programs with their professional staff or their colleagues on the oversight committees. This selective and circumscribed reporting is a far cry from the intent of the Intelligence Oversight Act of 1980. The same thing happened again with the Obama administration's experience with metadata activities. His administration again informed a few members of Congress about the programs, but they were prevented from taking any notes. They were prevented from discussing the legal ramifications with their staff. They were prevented even from discussing these programs in the secure confines of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. The facts are unassailable. Both the Bush and the Obama administrations have turned their backs on meaningful intelligence reporting to Congress. Now, lawmakers with responsibilities for intelligence oversight have been the victims of one evasion or outright lie after another over the years. In the lead up to the Iran-Contra scandal in the early 80s, for example, staff members on the National Security Council flatly denied before Congress any knowledge of the unauthorized covert actions in Iran or Nicaragua. When the truth came out, a high-ranking CIA official argued that his previous testimony sworn under oath on Capitol Hill in closed session had been, and I'm quoting him, technically correct, if specifically evasive. What does that mean? <laughs> After 9-11, Congress examined the question of why the intelligence agencies had failed to warn the American people about the impending attack. Once again, it ran to a brick wall. Intelligence Director George Tenet refused to provide key documents or witnesses to the Congressional Investigative Committee. More recently, both the Bush and Obama administrations have attempted to turn the emergency gang of eight provision into the normal intelligence reporting requirement, confining reports to only eight members of Congress, and often less than that. Congress shares the blame for this collapse of constitutional government. Before 1975, our representatives rarely raised questions about intelligence activities. In 1973, an unusually forthright intelligence director went up to Capitol Hill and asked Senator Stennis of Mississippi on the Oversight Committee if he would like to have more extensive CIA briefings the senator's response, no, no, my boy, don't tell me. Just go ahead and do it, but I don't want to know. Today, however, sufficient public pressure has mounted to prod Congress 
toward a long overdue appraisal of NSA activities. Lawmakers must now evaluate the wisdom of President Obama's recent reform proposals. As of last week, President Obama properly required NSA analysts to limit their probes into this metadata, examining records only within two linkages of a suspected terrorist, and to acquire a court order beforehand. Now, this is, this is good news. However, metadata will still be gathered on every single one of us. Exactly where this information will be stored is still up in the air. But I have no doubt the NSA will have easy access to it. And if history is any guide, the two links rule will fade away. Today's managers of the secret agencies may be trustworthy. But what about future managers? Shall we simply have confidence in them to do the right thing? Thomas Jefferson had some words to say about that line of thought. I'm quoting him. In questions of power, let no more be heard about confidence in men, but bind them down with the chains of the Constitution. I think Jefferson would agree with my central thesis here. In a democracy, massive spying against citizens is profoundly wrong and dangerous. America's promise of democracy has been an inspiring story unfolding since 1776. The journey has been anything but smooth. It has been deeply shaken by revolution, civil war, foreign conflicts, economic crises, the ongoing struggle over the rights of citizens. Yet despite setbacks from time to time, the past, our past achievements, I think, give hope for optimism about the future of this truly noble experiment in self-government. We will have to confront, though, the question of how an open society can accommodate secret agencies while still keeping them between the white lines of law and propriety. Technology has proven to be an unsettling companion as we travel into the future, with government surveillance capabilities outracing our current modes of accountability. The internet, social media, computer search engines, ubiquitous cell telephones, sophisticated data algorithms have opened up tempting opportunities for espionage unaccompanied, unaccompanied by a reliable set of laws to guard against abuse. As we now realize, the NSA has the capacity to know about all of our emails and other forms of messaging, whom we telephone, when, and for how long, our political, social and religious connections, even we learn in the times today, our sexual orientations. Everything we do, everything we are as human beings. Few, if any, members of Congress have been aware of how widely the NSA has cast its dragnet. More effective law will be required to assure that lawmakers and their staff on the intelligence committees are well informed about the NSA and the other intelligence agencies. Not just a gang of eight, not just a gang of four, or maybe even few members, fewer members. Good law will not be enough. After all, we had strong intelligence oversight laws in place before the Iran-Contra affair, but they didn't stop that from happening. Just as important is the spirit of power sharing between the executive and legislative branches. Strong incentives exist for this cooperation to occur even in these troubled times of political polarization. 
listen to director, former intelligence director Bob Gates, who has commented on the advantages of including lawmakers in intelligence deliberations. I'm quoting from a recent book of his. Some awfully crazy schemes might well have been approved had everyone present in the White House not known and expected hard questions, debate, and criticism from the Hill. And when on a few occasions Congress was kept in the dark and such schemes did proceed forward, it was nearly always to the lasting regret of the president involved. We will also have to make whistleblowing more feasible. If insiders with reservations about spy activities could more easily approach the oversight committees, perhaps they would air their misgivings here at home in a secure facility rather than recklessly fleeing to China or Russia. These are all significant challenges, though no more daunting than the obstacles we have already overcome as Americans on the pathway toward a more perfect democracy. Now we must carry the lamplight of responsible accountability into the dark corners of American government beginning with the National Security Agency. It has been such an honor for me to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for those insightful remarks. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's student responder, Megan White. Megan is a third year foundation fellow from Johns Creek, Georgia, majoring in international affairs and economics and minoring in French and Russian. It would be an understatement to say that Megan has taken advantage of all that UGA has to offer. She has served as the editor-in-chief of the Georgia Political Review, participated in the American Linguistic Atlas Project, served as a research assistant in the School of Public and International Affairs, and interned at the Center for International Trade and Security. She has studied Tudor his historiography at Oxford University, worked as a camp counselor in Russia's Mariel Republic, learned how to surf in Costa Rica, and enjoyed a critical language scholarship in Russia. This summer, Megan will intern in the Central Asia Division of the Office of the Coordinator of U.S. Assistance to Europe and Eurasia at the U.S. Department of State. Following graduation, she plans to attend graduate school to further study international relations and public policy. Please welcome Megan White. Over the summer when the story of the NSA leaks broke, the question of privacy versus security, so eloquently raised by Dr. Johnson, seemed to be everywhere. How safe are we? How safe do we want to be? Can we trust our government? Is there only one picture of Edward Snowden? <laughs> but just like the members of Congress Dr. Johnson mentioned, the general public was not necessarily asking the right questions, both before and after Edward Snowden's storied flight. This is simply because many, myself included, we're not equipped with the information necessary to truly understand what was and is happening in the United States intelligence community and how this affects our everyday lives. A friend and fellow student of mine put it best. As we stood across from the Venezuelan embassy in Moscow on the day Caracas granted asylum to Edward Snowden, he turned to me and said, I don't care how much metadata the government is spying on because quite frankly, I don't know what that is. <laughs> with only 2.4% of American college students studying computer science, my friend is certainly not alone. Being an educated member of society, or even a leader in society, however, does not necessarily require an advanced college degree in any particular area, but rather an, a degree of multidisciplinary literacy. The University of Georgia's purpose is to prepare young people to grow not only into experts in a particular field, but also into well-rounded, scrutinizing individuals with a wide breadth of knowledge. The School of Public and International Affairs, in particular, seeks to train students to become leaders in their communities who can effectively advocate for their interests and for the interests of people around them. 
International affairs and political science are unique in that their practitioners must be able to process information from all fields, agriculture, economics, nutrition, sociology, metadata, you name it. There's probably a law or a policy pertaining to it. In order to prepare future leaders and lawmakers to ask the right questions and to craft effective, educated policy, SPIA needs to ensure that it is training students to know their stuff and not only in the realm of political theory. To an extent, SPIA does a fine job of pushing its students to explore beyond the walls of Candler Hall. A degree in international affairs, for example, involves three foreign language classes, a math class, a fine arts class, and other requirements. Classes within the major to cover topics from East Asian political systems to international right-wing extremist groups. And the school hosts a world-class faculty who sculpt students' writing and communication skills, as well as an administration that is constantly seeking new opportunities for its students at a local, national, and even an international level. Student organizations thrive under the SPIA umbrella, particularly a favorite of mine, the Georgia Political Review. But while the school's support, uh, support system is superb and its course list is commendable, I can confidently say as a third year student preparing to enter the workforce in international development that the school is missing a few essential items. I could have graduated having never studied macroeconomics. I could have become a fully certified degree holding bachelor of international affairs having never taken a course in statistics. And I would have had it not been for SPIA's outstanding faculty mentorship. Let me tell you, it is very difficult to understand a data set if you have never taken a class in statistics and you've shut down the quantitative side of your brain immediately following high school graduation. Political economy does not make much sense at all when you think that GDP is a disease. <laughs> for two and a half years, I was content to collect my credits for graduation, confident that I would emerge well prepared for a career in my field. Little did I know that I knew very little. I've since added an economics major and I'm currently taking a, st a statistics course. And as a result of my quantitative renaissance, so to speak, I feel more engaged in all of my classes. I'm by no means an overnight data guru, but building even the most basic foundation in quantitative analysis is an important step into becoming a more effective problem solver. If SPIA wishes to produce students who will be able to solve problems and design policy in an increasingly complex digital and data-minded age, it needs to introduce a more quantitative, multidisciplinary curriculum. Students at the University of Georgia are fortunate to be enrolled in an institution with a wealth of classes and abundant room to explore. But while the information is there, the requirement, and in many cases the motivation, is not. So on this university's 229th birthday, I would like to encourage the administration, faculty, and students to continue to seek new ways to emphasize a full education so that this university may produce capable, well-prepared graduates for another 229 years and more. A redesigned curriculum requiring a background in diverse ways of thinking would give all students a leg up in an increasingly complex world, a world where perhaps to international affairs majors at the University of Georgia, metadata will be far less intimidating than Dr. Johnson's final exam. Thank you. <laughs>